So what is psychosis? Psychosis is uh, an umbrella term that we use to describe a set of experiences that affect the way that we perceive and interpret things around us. For example, that might include hearing voices or seeing things that aren't there that sometimes can be called hallucinations. It might involve interpreting things in a way that doesn't match up with what's actually happening. So perhaps feeling that other people are out to get you um, or trying to harm you, which we call paranoia. Um, or believing that you've got special abilities or superpowers, for example. And when people hold those beliefs very strongly, they're sometimes called delusions. Um, and also confused thinking and speech. So when people's words might get jumbled up or their ideas are hard to follow and they might find it hard to communicate with other people. So roughly how many people does psychosis affect? What we know is that, that these types of psychotic experiences are actually quite common. So we've done studies that show that kind of experiences such as hearing voices or feeling paranoid um, are actually reported by about 17% of young people. Um, so they're, they're quite common in the general population. The thing is, is that for many people, these are um, short-lived or um, only mild and don't really affect them. Yeah. Um, whereas for a smaller group of people, they might last a long time or be particularly distressing and get to a point that makes it hard to know what's real and to cope in their day-to-day -day life. And for that smaller group of people, that's when they might start to need um, professional help. Naomi came to speak to me about what treatment for psychosis would include. What treatments are there for people experiencing psychosis? Well, there are two or three really important areas that we would need to include in treatment. Um, so a lot of people benefit from medication, um, particularly if they're really distressed or really struggling with things. Um, so at the worst parts, they might want medication to help them get through. Um, and some people find medication at a lower dose can then also be preventative and help them stay well. Another area that's really important is what we call psychosocial functioning. So what we know from longitudinal studies with people's psychosis is that um, functional recovery early on predicts people doing better. So what I mean by that is, can we get them back to school? Can we get them back into work? Can we get them back doing the hobbies that they love? Can we get them back seeing their friends? Can we get them back responsible for their home or their pets? Um, all those things that kind of contribute to somebody functioning well stands them in good stead in the long term. So uh, teams might support them accessing the community, building their confidence up again, building their skills, thinking about how to work with occupational health or getting them, getting them back into their job, that sort of thing. And then another big area is psychological therapy. Over the years we've learned more and more about what keeps psychosis going or what might kind of make it snowball and make it worse for somebody. Psychological therapy is about really addressing for an individual those specific maintenance factors. So every psychological therapy would start with a formulation. A formulation is a posh word for I need a theory or a model for this individual about what's going on for them. Mm -hmm. So we would drill down for that person what was going on before it happened, what kind of responses they gave to it, what behaviours they changed or did more or less of um, that potentially helped them feel better but actually exacerbated the problem. Um, and we'd be looking at reversing those. Definitely like on a person-to-person -person basis. It's not a kind of one-size-fits-all. You're exactly right. Mm -hmm. It's not a one-size-fits-all. There are some themes that come up over and over again, and a therapist would be looking at the evidence and saying, which themes should I be definitely considering? But then it would be absolutely looked at on a person-to-person -person basis. So the sorts of things we might be thinking of with an individual are, what does this mean to me? What sense am I making? Of it. What we know is that what it means to us really, really impacts how it feels. Mm -hmm. So some people will be thinking, I'm, I'm going mad, I'm going crazy, I'm losing control of my mind, um, I'm not myself. And it's really important to kind of help people make make better sense of what's going on so it could be actually this is a really normal experience mm -hmm. this is this happens to a lot of people but also maybe what you've been through it's it's really understandable that this is how things have happened so we'd start somewhere like that thinking first of all about working with voices one thing that would be really important is to change the features that make it really scary and the idea is we'd think with people about how to uh, work with their voices or their visions to take this thing out, to make them less scary. It might be 
uh, imagining them as characters that you can dismiss or thinking them of as bullies that you want to try and distance from or thinking of them as something you can you can befriend rather than constantly fighting you'll notice that we're not necessarily talking about getting rid of voices or visions. For some people, they'll go away. For other people, they will continue. And so the trick is actually how to live with them mm -hmm. and not constantly be running away or avoiding or fighting them. So making peace with them, I suppose, in a way. The other area would be looking at people's behavioural responses. What we know about people's behaviours is that they're totally understandable and they're totally reasonable given what the person believes, but they can actually shape and change the experience the person has in the world, which means they're kind of potentially gathering more and more evidence that's in line with their concern. So as an example, um, if somebody is very paranoid um, and they avoid going out of the house as much as possible, the first thing to say is that they might, they might never find out that they're not under threat in the way they think. Um, but the second thing to point out is if they do go out and about but they do things to try and make themselves invisible or feel better about it, maybe they've got the hood up, maybe they're avoiding eye contact, maybe they're keeping away from people, what might happen here is that actually their behaviour looks more odd. Mm -hmm. So actually potentially they're attracting more attention than they might otherwise mm -hmm they start to notice perhaps people are looking at them a bit more. Because if you see somebody rushing down the street with their head down and the hoodie up, they mm -hmm. look a bit more suspicious. Yeah. Um, so that behaviour would then have a snowball effect? That's a really good way of putting it. That's absolutely right. So um, the more we think we're at risk, the more we do to compensate or to try and avoid it. And then the slightly odder we come across, the slightly less positive experiences we have with people, the more evidence we think we've got for that original concern. So is the aim of treatment to try and break that cycle? That's right. The aim of treatment is to identify what, what interpretations or what behaviours are potentially maintaining this problem and then systematically go through and try and change or reverse those behaviours. And when someone's getting treatment for psychosis, is it all three of those aspects that you've just talked about or... Is it two of them, one? How does that work? Well, you do different treatments at different times. So, for example, when somebody's really muddled in their thinking or really struggling with reality, it might be quite a hard time to do psychological therapy or it might be quite a hard time to go back into work. So you'd actually be thinking with that person and maybe with their family, what feels right to do when? It might be that we start with things like medication or, or certain lifestyle factors. So we would want to be thinking about getting a person's sleep back to a healthy state and um, we know that that's going to hopefully protect them against worsening of those symptoms yeah. and we know that of course then that when we're not sleeping we're more vulnerable to all kinds of stuff anxiety depression mm -hmm. etc so we get that sleep back we might be thinking about factors like are they getting enough exercise are they healthy in themselves and um, we might be thinking about valued occupation and giving the person something that is important and meaningful to them. We all need things in life that are important and meaningful. It gives us direction. It gives us something to be focusing on. And that can help reduce the preoccupation with, for example, paranoid ideas. So that might be what we start with. Medication, lifestyle changes, psychosocial changes. And then we'd be building up into what, what feels doable or what feels appropriate next. And that will be different person to person. And it will depend a little bit on what's available locally. Does that mean after these treatments, the person is cured for life? It'll vary. It'll vary person to person. What we know about psychosis is an umbrella term. It, it describes a range of different experiences that could fall into different diagnoses. Um, some people will have one episode, recover, never have another, go on with their lives, back to normal. Uh, another group of people will have multiple episodes so, but potentially be quite well in between time. So they might have a period of being unwell, they recover, they go back to work, they go back to their usual things, they might have another one down the line. There are some people where the symptoms never fully go away. So it might be that actually what they're doing in their therapy or with their professional support is thinking about how do I live well with this in the same way that somebody might live well with chronic pain, for example. How can I still have a meaningful, fulfilling life that I love and I want to live even though I've got these experiences with me as well? I asked Jess to tell me more about what would be involved in psychological therapy. One of the most important things is how people make sense of their experiences. 
So if somebody starts to hear voices or feel like the world isn't real anymore or start to feel suspicious of others, this can be quite confusing and frightening. And it's human nature to try and find meaning and explain the things that are happening to us. When people interpret these unusual experiences as threatening and caused by something outside of their control, they can be difficult to cope with, leaving them feeling frightened or powerless. And we believe that it's the way people make sense of these experiences and their responses to them which play a big role in making them persist. We want to help people to develop explanations of their experiences that are less upsetting. So for example, rather than a sign that you're losing your mind or that demons are tormenting you, we might help people to understand their voices as a normal part of human experience and harmless. People can learn to take back control from their voices, to be assertive and to stand up to them, and to create a healthy relationship with these experiences where they can choose when to listen to them and develop strategies to tune them out, to be able to carry on doing the things that they want to despite these voices. So what about paranoia? What would keep that going? At the heart of paranoia is a feeling of being unsafe and under threat from other people. And researchers found a range of psychological factors that contribute to this paranoia by making people feel more vulnerable and focused on threats. And this includes things such as low self-esteem, poor sleep, and certain thinking habits as well. So for example, a tendency to jump to conclusions based on very little information and then having a problem considering alternative explanations for what's going on. There's also the habit of worrying over and over again about all the terrible things that could happen. We know that worry is a little bit like an avalanche, that it can take something quite small and make it snowball. And we want to work with people to help them overcome their fears of others by learning to take control of their worry, to slow down their thinking and to come up with more balanced ideas of what's going on around them and ultimately to go out into the world and test out their beliefs, to check things out for themselves, and hopefully develop new ideas about being safe enough to do the things that are important to them in life. At first, when I started hearing voices, they said things like, They're out to get you. What are you doing? You're always getting it wrong. Be careful what you're saying. You can't trust anyone. God's sake. Yeah, just like that. I tended to believe them, and it made me feel suspicious and paranoid. Yeah, you should be suspicious. Don't tell anyone anything. I'm looking out for you. I'm the only one you can trust. I really wasn't able to distance myself from them. You don't need to be distanced. When they were talking all the time, I... You should be suspicious. They're not interested uh, in you. I, you know you're not interested. I, you tell them I found it... I found it really hard to you concentrate. Hard to you don't need to... Try to send them away. We're not going anywhere. Well, or ignore them. Great, so now you're or argue ignoring. back. You know you're Sh shut up, I don't need to listen to you anymore. You do need to listen. You I found it really draining listen. and exhausting. They want to get rid of me. They want you to get rid of me. Listen to us. Why are you telling and them And when I this? couldn't get rid of them, it was totally demoralising. You can't demoralizing. trust them. Watch your back. Why are you telling you them You can't all trust this? them. Watch your back. I worried that I would never get better. In therapy, I learned Rather than fighting with the voices, need to, fight to find a way them. to make peace and distance myself from them. For example, giving them names to take some of the sting out of it. Or thinking of them as annoying friends, constantly giving advice that I don't need to listen to. I learned to think of them as background noise, like the radio on in the kitchen. This makes me feel a little more in control and my voices don't affect me so much. I'm able to get out and do the things I used to do before this started like meet up with my friends and all dancing. If you or someone you know is affected by the issues raised in this film, there are places that you can go for help and support. There is a lot of information available on the internet which can sometimes be confusing or misleading. In the links below this film, you can find a list of some trusted organisations that publish high quality, reliable information and give advice on evidence-based treatments.